I'm Besa Luce, and welcome to Other Talking Points, a K2.0 podcast. In this episode, we will be talking about historical memory and the documentation of the past. Historical memory is shaped by what is documented. What we remember or celebrate, what we overlook or forget, is a result of the narratives we choose or which are chosen for us. The official historical record is always subject to attempts to reveal or conceal different facts or narratives. The Balkans, where history has often been used as a tool to propagate nationalist or state communist fantasies, is no exception to this general rule. Official histories often serve as a site of power place, where the strong choose to glorify often themselves and their ideological forebearers. Women, ethnic minorities, and other marginalized groups are often excluded or misrepresented. The peripheral or superficial inclusion of the marginalized creates a collective memory that is fragmented and incomplete. Moreover, such erasure is never an innocent omission. It is a deliberate act that aims to perpetuate exclusion into the future. But there are a number of grassroots initiatives working to challenge official histories by documenting and disseminating a wider range of historical experiences and narratives. Through oral history, film, photography, and exhibitions, they are documenting and sharing the stories and events that did not make it into the official narrative about the past. There are many such efforts and initiatives, but today we'll be talking in detail about two. The first is the exhibition A Site of Political Struggle, Trepcha Mine, 1989, a collaboration between Oral History Kosovo and Forum ZFD. The second is They Live, Student Lives Through Context-Based Art Practices, a collaboration between several public institutions, universities, and NGOs from Montenegro, Serbia, and Croatia that documented the lived experience of student dorm life across generations. These exhibits and projects like them don't merely fill gaps. They are questioning issues of representation by bringing together records, stories, and experiences that are absent from official narratives. To discuss these initiatives, I'm very happy to be talking with Ermir Krasnice and Milena Prelevic. Ermir Krasnice is a researcher, curator, and executive director of Oral History Kosovo. She recently curated the exhibition on the Kosovo Trepcha minor strikes of 1989. Milena Prevelic is a cultural worker and member of the Institute of Contemporary Art in Montenegro. Recently, she was the Montenegro coordinator for the They Live project. Ermir, thanks so much for being on the show. So happy to be here, Besa. Milena, I'm looking forward to talking to you as well. Hi, thanks for having me. So let's get the conversation started. And I deliberately didn't want to give a lot of details about your two projects, uh, because I would like for you to go a bit through them and to get into your own thoughts of how the, the projects came about. And Ermir, uh, you've been working for over a decade now with Oral History Kosovo <laughs> in uh, documenting uh, a lot of lived experiences and stories of people that talk about Kosovo's history, but also set it up in a bigger global uh, context as well. And I'm just curious, what led you to the project on Trepcha Minor Strike from 89 and why particularly now? Uh, yes, I've been involved with oral history because of close to a decade. It's crazy to to kind of <laughs> think, think that it has been uh, this long. Um, I don't know. Uh, we're constantly looking for less documented perspectives uh, in history and less uh, visible subjects in history. So, of course, that uh, dissolution of Yugoslavia is a big event, no matter from what angle we look at uh, and the miners were the first to kind of address the violation of human rights but also the revocation of uh, of the constitution of 1972 so uh, it's it's kind of one of those key events that you cannot um, avoid or or kind of walls around it so um we started the project in, in the beginning of 2020 with forum uh, zdf and and of course um the pandemic happened and then we were working between the waves of of <laughs> of the of covid so it quite it was quite difficult to get a larger picture of w- what went on because everything was happening in in 
batches somehow. That's how we were doing the interviews and that's how we were slowly uh, immersing into the story. And somehow always in dialogue with this major crisis and then looking at our own individual crisis. It, it was a bit chaotic, but also uh, important to go through. Uh, about the question of nowness, I don't know. It was <laughs> it was an ever evolving now at that point, and we finally managed to wrap up the project in, to, in the beginning of twenty twenty three. Um, I don't. I I always hesitate when I when I'm doing these projects. I always hesitate to to bring about um, um, to place them in in this. Um, uh, glorify them in the way I like to really delve in delve into that particular story. I know that there are always these tendencies to to look in retroactively to look at this point in time and and see a major um, importance in them. And usually, people tend to connect the Tripcha uh, strike as the beginning of our independent uh, uh, organize forms of organizing. And it is in some degree, but then uh, there's big part of the tape chai is, is the work working class culture, and which I think was the was the main emancipatory political force behind it, which we cannot neglect or separate from the communist heritage that we have, and which we encounter. This is the issue that we encounter with all the projects that are embedded in in the in the communist period, which we like to think about them, revisit them, uh, contemplate about it, but we like to also disembed them from the from the from communism, which is a bit problematic and uh, as much as it as we uh, attend, attempt to to reconstruct or reconnect or or create a dialogue with it, we also have to, uh, re, uh, we revision it in, to some degree, which is our problem with our generation today. But I can be more specific. Why we why we? Um, I, I guess I just delved right away into the to the issues that come with it. Um, it was really important to look at the minor strike because. Um, not many were um i mean there were protests by students at the time at the at the 88 uh, and beginning of 89 uh, opposing the revocation of a constitution of 1974 i think i said 72 before yeah. uh, <laughs> so. we're correcting it's fine it's 1974 yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i'm i'm just like editing myself as i speak and then um it was that, and then there were the miners that were more um, aware about the worth of Trepcha as a as an economic giant, and they knew that they could use that uh, in the political bargain of the time. And then one thing led to the other. At first, they had the the march in November of uh, 1988, uh, which they marched from Mitrovica to Pristina. And then they decided that that wasn't the right political tool. And at the same time, a lot of uh, political representatives uh, from the Albanian side were being uh, discharged. So there, there was the rise of Milosevic as well. And then they decided to close themselves for eight, eight days in the mine, which were very difficult conditions uh, to really um, stay in and and kind of make a point from that uh, underground. Um, we we stay. So they were opposing this in very difficult conditions. Uh, they were articulating their position, political position uh, in the underground. And then, um, although the event was really big and forms a great part in our collective memory, I realized that not, not much is known about it. Like not people of my generation generation or younger and um we the way we do our work is that we always build the archive first so that becomes a resource for everybody else so they can join in i mean the the community of scholars uh, citizens whoever that has such a memory we try through the archive to activate a memory about a specific event and this was the same procedure uh, that we did with we, we uh, the way we did the interviews, we also uh, published them at the same time that we were doing them. And then 
of course, by the time that pandemic kind of wrapped itself up, we also planned the exhibition, which was another way of engaging with that history, but also a different way of presenting it. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Admir. And I would actually, Milan, I'd like to connect now with you. And I think I think there's two different things that uh, Admir brought up that I think uh, connect very well also with your project. The first, it's about the archives themselves and how to use archive as a way to rebuild like that that memory. And this is something that you do very much in your in the project that you participated in. They live because the project came about through a large body of archives across different countries in the region, looking at what it meant to be a student across different generation and different uh, uh, different times. So if you can talk a bit about how was that process for you with the, with the archives and g- going about collecting and building that archive, but then putting it into an exhibition and telling a story uh, around it. And then Era also talked, she mentioned student protests, and I think this is something that your project also inevitably talks about because there's also 68 before, then there's also leading up to the uh, fall of Yugoslavia. So if you can talk about how these two different uh, processes were part of your work in the They Live project. Um, yes, of course. Uh, so as, as we, yeah, this is a similar story uh, uh, as uh, told now and uh, about, we are talking about community archives and Project Day Live, as we, as you said in um, uh, introduction is a, a project about archive uh, of uh, student experiences. And uh, this is a project that actually was developed within the framework of European Union's Creative Europe program for culture and media. And as, as you mentioned as well, besides uh, the project leader, which was Student City Cultural Center from Belgrade, uh, the partners were, were us, uh, Institute uh, for Contemporary Art from Montenegro. We had this center, International Center for Archival Research, Icarus, uh, Croatia from Zagreb. We have uh, Academy of Applied Arts from Rijeka and Faculty of uh, Audiovisual Communications um, at King uh, Juan Carlos University from Madrid. So we had uh, Madrid as well included in, a, in the project in Madrid experience. Uh, inside of uh, of these archives, I, I have to say that I, I will speak mostly from the um, perspective and from the uh, Podgorica, uh, um, uh, from our experience with with archiving Podgorica student dormitory. Uh, uh, each partner worked uh, alone on their archives, and uh, we we use the same methodology. But I don't have uh, um, uh, the same insights uh, on, on their their research and their conclusions as I have uh, from our point of view, obviously. Um, we also had uh, uh, we have uh, several activities planned as a part of, part of the project, and we started with uh, internal trainings uh, uh, on conceptions, uh, conception and methodology of oral history, and this digital archiving. Um, and of course, um, this digital archiving uh, had to include the process of collecting and digitalization of photographic material, student life, but of course, recording all oral history interviews uh, with former and student uh, and uh, current student uh, uh, of student dormitories uh, around uh, around Montenegro. We we thought that we were going, going to work only in Podgorica, student dormitory of Podgorica, but Montenegro is so small and we have a lot of uh, limited access to, to institutional art archives. We were also working, uh, our project actually also uh, overlapped with the COVID-19 pandemic. So there were, of course, a lot of a lot of challenges uh, happening to us and a lot of uh, issues to navigate and coordinate during the, the the process of archiving, which is complex on its own, uh, and uh, without uh, having uh, another uh, major uh, um, happening in in the worldwide at, at, at that point. So yes, we we started the archiving process in um, September 2020, and the idea was to talk to, as I said, to former and current students, and uh, um, but it was very it was very hard to reach to them. Um, when doing a community archive, st- starting this process, there's a lot of uh, problems around the suspicion and the, the no, no trust of, from uh, from the community that you, that you want to actually talk to and that you want to give the voice to. So 
we had a lot of uh, preparations. We had to to think of the channels that we uh, through through which we are going to come to the students, how to uh, build that trust. It was especially difficult with the uh, with the former older um, students who who didn't know. We had to explain the purpose of the project, the data regulation. Um, so that people, so that we can build this trust, and uh, um, uh, so that people can will us accept to talk, to actually, and to share their their experience. Um, so there was a lot of pre preset, pre, pre, a lot of preparations happening around that, and then uh, then we approached the the interviews and the, the digitalization and this sample that this archive that we are having that's uh, and I'm speaking only about Montenegrin archive is a very small sample. Uh, still, there's a like, like a, um, a, we have a lot of photographs and uh, documentations and interviews views but again still so, so small sample but this is still uh, it, the, the 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 gathering of the and making of the archive of course it will not stop as the project uh, finish it will stay and it will be open in something and it's something that needs to be built uh, more um I'll just jump now. I guess that we will uh, dwell more into how, how this uh, about our methodology and what we did and how uh, 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 later that we will do that later. I will just jump to to a few uh, other activities that were a part of uh, of the project that, that that were important because this project is actually um, as 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 I said the, um, one part of it was creating an archive, community archive. And the other was actually um, related to engaging the students to uh, make the contemporary art by using the tools of community archives. So that was for us a very important part, part of the project in terms of, uh, we wanted to include the, the, the students to, to, to create this, uh, to share the, the, those their, their experiences, but again, um, the, uh, to be direct co create of, of the archive that we are making and of the other activities that were that were part of the project. So other activities were uh, two exhibitions. Um, uh, one was a product of the artist in residence uh, program that was happening in uh, each partner uh, country. Uh, we had um, we had this curator and contemporary painter in Montenegro, in Podgorica. Uh, curator was Sonia Dragovic and contemporary uh, painter was Milena Vukoslavovic. And they, they worked uh, uh, for several months with students uh, researching and uh, discussing the um, uh, discussing the uh, spaces uh, where the students live, the campus, the dormitories, the um, and how these spaces actually shape their lives. And the result of those, those that research was this exhibition called uh, "Playing House in Cramped Labyrinth: Stories from uh, uh, Student Spaces in Podgorica." Uh, and the other uh, um, activity that we had was also exhibition. It was a selec selection uh, of photographs that was and those photographs were selected by students uh, from each partner country and um, these photographs were presented in a, as I said in an exhibition and students from Podgorica concretely actually were included in a curatorial process they 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 learn how to curate photograph exhibition they they research archive again and had the, this opportunity to to co-create to directly create a cultural event um and yeah i will finish now with that and uh, uh continue later with other questions Thank, thanks uh, milena there's uh, again uh, there's something you said that i now i want to connect with uh, with ermir but also ermir you talked uh, earlier about how on one hand the trepsha minor strike is such an important political uh, moment uh, for kosovo and for the bigger ex yugoslav project i would say and it's not that as a date or as an event it's not necessarily known it's known that it happened but then to get into the more details of what went about, you, you said that how for us, for like in our generation, you'll see that there's a lack of actually more information and a lack of uh, a lack of knowledge. And I think what your project brings that it's different is that 
actually you also talked to the miners them, uh, themselves and I think the inclusion of their voice is so important in your uh, in your project so and Milena said something earlier she talked about limited access to institutional archives which I think uh, is an experience for us in Kosovo as well and then also about how to build trust when you're creating an archive from scratch. So can you talk about these two issues in relationship to the project of the Trepcha miners in terms of how you approached also them, the extent to which they were willing and how they became involved in the in the project, but also how uh, was it to some extent also a response to the fact that we do have limited uh, state, let's say, properly organized archives and how, so how you see all of these different factors playing and feeding into one another? Oh, God. Um, yeah, I mean, um, every uh, research topic, because we annually dedicate ourselves in, in something very specific, and then we kind of, with that theme, we also uh, narrow do down who's our target group and what are the co communities that we are working with. So that, in a way, uh, defines that, that the scope of the project and also who who the potential interviewees are. We maybe don't have uh, the 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 crisis of legitimacy, <laughs> perhaps that uh, that um, Milena had because it was the first project of its kind. Uh, by now, we have a large uh, archive with over three hundred interviews, and we have a very stable address online which we can direct our, uh, the people that we're interviewing and so they can uh, more or less see uh, the type of interviews that we are conducting and um, and so this initial stage of building trust is, is a bit more easy easier and becoming always easier and easier due to the work that has been previously done of course we we usually go for um in, in the case with the miners, we went with the syndicate. Syndicate was really important, especially after the after the miners were discharged uh, from work um, due to their participation in the in the strike. So uh, there was this syndicate that that operated outside of the uh, corporate, um, and it was of course uh, bottom up. It was organized from the workers, so that was our biggest ally in the project and, and building trust uh, with our uh, interviewees. Um, of course, when we go for certain topics that we decide to, to research, it always has to do with the fact that it hasn't been uh, documented much or not much testimonies have been produced from that pool of people or we identify that also in the archives there there isn't much uh, about the topic and especially all the topics that that have to do with the 90s and onwards the way we were deinstitutionalized and we were uh, taken out of institutions uh, it it speaks of a of a you you always identify this huge gap in documentation. We were not part of the institution to to use those infrastructures of memory to create memory of our own community. So basically, everything that has to do um, after eighty nine and 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 nineties onwards, you find very little. I mean, when when we 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 were building the the archive. Uh, Beside the testimonies, it was hard to uh, to create. We use the biographical structure, so that always allows the, the the narrator to to speak a lot about their context from which they're coming from, and 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 create this relatability, which um, helps the storytelling. But then, uh, when we wanted to build other context that is political, it it. It was a huge issue in that regard, or try to design questions that are more specific. It was hard, and in this in this specific context, it helped that it was biographical, uh, and they can they can teach us about things that we wouldn't even be able or know how to ask about, and so that that facilitated the whole uh, trust building, but also uh, communication, but also this process of of joint um, knowledge production. Um, even the exhibition uh, was very much a, a, a set of different archives. We, we used a lot of uh, 
newspaper clips from Real India. Um, we used books, random, very random. It's not like you had a series of scholars <laughs> covering or dealing with this topic. There were perhaps there were books on um civilian resistance and you would find a little chapter about the miners then perhaps somebody did a book on the british documents uh who who began the whole mining activity in mitrovica so there, there were bits and pieces here and there that you would patch it up somehow to make sense and try to kind of at least figure out to what extent people remember the Trepcha mine because it started in 1926, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because I'm not good with dates today. But uh, but then sometimes, if because it's a industrial community, even their grandparents, they worked for Trepcha. So sometimes we, we would encounter people who had memories dating that it was within the family they were it was passed down to them and it was like a post memory which we could research through through people uh our contemporaries um so there were like different stages and then and then you come across a lot of bizarre facts because as i mentioned before you you would know of trepcha as this g economic giant but then it was really hard to secure uh, statistics about its uh, about its successes. Like it was very hard to to find in which period they they had a, a they had a I don't know had a big presence in uh, a mining uh, industry in Europe. And then you're left with the question: Maybe they never had it. Maybe it was just the subsidies that kept it kept it in such a high regard and, and they had bigger salaries. And of course, the 74 constitution made Yugoslavia to invest more down here as it was always referred to. So there are lots of gaps in it, which when you do an archive or an exhibition afterwards to invite a different type of audience to, to join in, in into that conversation, you really hope that the intervention of the historians would be greater and just point out the 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 gaps that your own research has because as we know what what you research through memory is faulty and might miss out on big events or might or you might have just worked with a certain group memory so it has its limits and the methodology is really aware of it that's, yeah, and I, I can actually use this moment to connect maybe a bit to talk a bit about oral history and the, the, the methodology behind that. And uh, both of you have used oral history as a way to build these uh, uh, these archives. And uh, and Mira mentioned maybe some of like the perceived also gaps with oral history, but sometimes I think that uh, also by historians themselves, there's that you know, they maybe tend to see it as an unreliable uh, a method and uh, to uh, to fear that maybe it lacks objectivity, not to say that there's objectivity necessarily in history. But uh, Milena, maybe you can start and to talk a, a bit about what has been your uh, relationship and how with oral history, it's a methodology. And and wh what do you think of these tendencies to also refute, refute it sometimes? And then Ermira, I would like for you to also uh, talk a bit more about this um, uh, as well. But Milena, let's start with uh, with you. Um, yes, so I think it's very, I think it's very important to, to, to start with the fact that the way and the mechanism of uh, archiving are in, inevitably impacting the archive itself. So be it through direct influence in the selection of material or indirectly, for example, in interviewing or by use, just by using specific questions uh, and by the presence of the interviewer, there's always, a, it, it, it's, it's a, it, it, there's a pressure of, of, of its kind and we're making a setup that's, uh, that could actually influence the, the how, how, how much objectivity, objectivity we, we actually gonna gain from, from that. But for me, oral history is as a part of this experience I had, uh, during the project uh, uh, are a tool that uh, gives a, a lot of uh, um, information and uh, richness uh, uh, to, this, uh, to the archive itself because we have the opportunity
opportunity to talk to um, to, to uh, represent to one of the representatives of the, the community that we are best in investigating and that we want want to give voice to, um, and that person can talk to, talk about their experiences from the past to talk about how uh, what they think they do, what they wanted to do, uh, what they think they should do, and how now what's the perspective now on the on the on this past itself so there's a lot of uh, layers out there so there's a lot of as i said information and uh, uh resource to 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 dwell into and to to, to think about it um as I said, we we had uh, uh, an issue with the with the trust and the, uh, s s building the trust, but uh, we later found uh, we started uh, we started working with the former and the students, and it was uh, it was very interesting uh, in terms of diversity. And it's always like this with the, with the community uh, ar archives. It gives you uh, it, you you get to tell those uh, you get to uncover those hidden stories that you wouldn't find. Uh, in uh, uh, mainstream repositories, uh, and um, this is for me, in a way, we are somehow democrat democratizing democratizing the process, uh, the the access to 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 those voices, to those parts of histories that, that that were hidden, and that's why our uh, oral history is inevitably uh, very very uh, important. I mean, we are preserving ma marginalized voices and perspectives. We are capturing personal experiences and, and emotions. We are, uh, when you're doing pro, uh, oral history, you're providing uh, uh, multiple perspectives and uh, again um, documenting uh, uh, cultural traditions and practices. And again, uh, at the end, uh, encouraging the community uh, to to engage and to participate uh, in creating its own uh, history. Mm -hmm. And, and Ermir, would you? I would love for you to connect on this question uh, as well, because I think, I think one of the reasons for them, for myself, why I'm so drawn to oral uh, history is because I think of the tendencies over the past, well, I don't know how many years to say now, but a lot of the past, the decades in the region, for there to be this, there's this tendency to think of history as very singular and is one all-encompassing truth, while what. All our countries have gone through politically, economically, socially, culturally. There's so much more complexity to it. And, and I think we get to understand sometimes some of that uh, complexity by listening to people's stories and these also individual like struggles or experiences. So when, when there's this kind of refute towards oral history, like where do you stand? What, uh, how, do you, how do you see it? I mean, uh, I, I, it helps to, to I mean... Definitely, oral history is not a uniform methodology. Every oral historian that engages with it, it shapes its own practice and contributes to the practice itself. So it's not like is, there is one way to be an oral historian or to, to create oral history projects. And that's a great part of it, uh, I think. And then when, but also I think it's, it, it, it helps the methodology to grow the practice itself and to to take on other meanings and engage with other fields because it's not a theory it's not just a methodology it's not just this or that so uh when you integrate it within your own field of of study or within the field of where you contribute as a scholar you always enable it to grow so even in regards to historians, I think they have to do the groundwork. So I never get this, this initial refusal of the methodology. You have if, if the people are alive, you have to speak to them. So it's and history cannot exist just by interpreting documents in the archives or because they're always the way the archives are made, even ours one day will be seen from that. Like I will be judged as well, but we will always be judging people that create those institutions and think from what lens they're collecting and and why they are creating and who are they excluding and who are they including in them. So um I mean, whatever source we use. I may be a historian or oral historian, whichever source that I'm using, I have to think who's the producer of that knowledge, where based on what 
legitimacy this document rests on who has who has used it what are the existing interpretations of it i have to stabilize it i have to take that responsibility on my own as a researcher and as a scholar to 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 create a more objective ground for that document documents are not or archives are not objective on, on their own we have to make them we have to place them in a larger conversation or in dialogue with other uh, documents to have them be objective they're not nothing is objective by itself so it's same with uh, with the uh, oral histories as well depends on uh, depends on how you're using them as well if you're using them to democratize the history and who gets to speak within it or who gets to shape historical narratives uh then of course that goes unquestionably because you're just legitimizing uh, people's stories. You're not questioning them. You're not investigating them. You're not putting them on trial and see whether their narrative holds. You're you're just giving them voice. Uh, and even that, sometimes it sounds condescending, giving voice to people. <laughs> like, I'm not giving voice to anybody. I enter the, that process of uh, co-production. That's how I consider it those settings in which interviews happen they are i affect them by being there by the type of language i use by the way that i present the project to them so i really have to level and read the room very often to be able to enter that process and encourage them to to share their stories and even if, if there are historians that are vocal or not, even if there are doubts whether about its credibility, I think what, what we don't we should keep in mind is, is that it's a process in which storytelling happens and you cannot refute storytelling. Like even if these people are coming up with God knows what kind of stories, they're still valid uh, cultural artifacts. They might not be historical facts, truths or this or that, but it's storytelling. Can you <laughs> disqualify storytelling? I mean, these people uh, are sitting with you and in, uh, and you're supporting them in this process where they're kind of performing. They're, they're just doing that while they're talking to you. That's very valuable in itself. And of course, then if it's true, then of course you're going to put it in dialogue with, I don't know, other facts that have been established as fact and they are stable and and you can compare and see what depends on what you're using it really. But it what's unrefutable is the fact that it's a cultural artifact the way it has happened in one point in time. And it's unreproducible in another point in time because when you re-interview that person, they're not going to give you the same interview. It's something else affected by other conditions, affected by you differently. They're engaging with you differently. They're engaging with their memories differently. They're situating themselves differently in, in, in light of, of new political events or social events that they're going through or connecting to, or the way that, which affects the way they're revisiting their own lives. True, and also then ends up, I guess, affecting also how people accessing that knowledge today uh, get to uh, experience it and understand it. And Milena, I'm, in this regard, I'm curious because in your project, you're, you've looked at your, you've documented student life since the end of World War II, but also continuing to uh, today. And one of the goals of the project was also to kind of see what what. That, what did it mean to be a student then and what it continues continues to mean for different generations uh, uh, today? So I'm very much and curious for you to talk about maybe just how did you see current students, let's say in Podgorica, in Montenegro, engaging with the archive that you built of Montenegrin student uh, uh, student life? Because I, I, I've read also a bit also your interviews on the work and I think... Uh, there was also this sentence of how like they uh, ended up seeing maybe that today students are more apathetic, they're less politically involved when they get to see what it meant to be a student, student let's say in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but sometimes also from today's perspective, we tend to always think of these moments of resistance in the past as to maybe also idealize them a bit or, or not, because you have to also have to understand them within the context, the time of when they took place, and then also to understand yourself in the specific context, when political context where you are. So how was this uh, uh, engagement also by younger generations today with, with your project? And do you feel like your project 
also served as an avenue for them to understand their their past, the, the past of the student differently? Um, yes. So uh, all those con conclusions that you mentioned should should be left open because there should be open. We, we can't for sure say that that something is uh, truth and something isn't, and that one that one students are more active, uh, politically active, and one uh, others are not, and so on. But. Um, um, we had we had we had issues uh, reaching to them, uh, but uh, when um, uh, reaching them, uh, but one one of the of course pandemic was one one part of of, of the issue. Uh, later was um, uh, the, the the their passivity. Uh, is not a product of they're not caring too much about cult cultural events and archives and the uh, stories that are actually um, about them. It's uh, it's that they were neglected and left to its own devices for for so long, and that could be one part of the issue. Uh, but we 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 worked um, during the we we worked with students uh, in archive creation, and after that we had the actually the curator of the exhibition and art artist organized a workshop that attended like um, uh, seventeen uh, stu uh, current students, and uh, this workshop were very productive they um, they were really engaging with the archive they wanted to to discuss those old narratives and uh, um, the current narratives and to see wh wh where they are standing uh, wh what's their position and what are their problems and what the other people uh, other communities uh, uh, do the, the other communities see their problems and he hear them do are um, is government governmental institutions aware aware of their existence at all Th those are those were some questions that arose uh, during these workshops because they they felt invisible and they they, they still still are I mean um, in last uh, couple of months we have issues with the uh, students are actually were pr protesting and um, they they had issues with uh, electricity and hot water in their dormitories. So it's 2023, and they're they're fighting those, so to say, ba basic that should be basic battles at, at this point. Um, but um, when it comes to this history of uh, high, high, higher education, this uh, it, it, it was always comprised of uh, university history that were celebrating uh, um, those accounts of uh, institutional growth and achievement and uh, um, and excess, uh, success. And within those those type of history, students were only featured as a dentum, and uh, they were romanticized like uh, uh, through floscals that students are are future leaders and so on. And I I do believe that the. Uh, we cannot stay with this version of history uh, of educations that are based solely or predominantly on a, a social and political structure. And at the same time, those histories disregard the people who actually inhabit those structure and uh, they disregard their locations, their forms, their uh, uh, dimensions, and again, their, their the, the meaning of their experience. So I think that that's the, the, the biggest uh, actually uh, importance and value of the, the these uh, community archives that we are building around that we are trying to build um, is uh, to to challenge these uh, official narratives um, that exist and that existed. Uh, as for the students, uh, what uh, I, I will speak just from um, I'll just give my insights, and uh, they're all open to discussion and. Uh, uh, when it comes to 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 to, to interviewing the students, the, 
Uh, I must agree with Era that that every human experience is valid, and we we won't, won't argue with that, obviously. So yes, when I was interviewing, I was like, uh, there were conclusions from the students as well, and uh, I, I, I would conclude the, the similar that, that we have the students are more passive than they were, but that's that that that's not something that we can say. That we have some research of Montenegrin students that this passivity. When I say passive, uh, uh, I concretely mean uh, are, were they included in political activities, in social activities, cultural activities, that kind of passivity, or uh, maybe I'm using the wo wrong word, but but. Uh, you will forgive me for that. And but again, they, they we the, the, those were the conclusions. But again, we we can't um, analyze uh, that. We have to approach these conclusions with the multidisciplinary um, tools and to 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 research and to think what was the, was the actually what was the reason behind it and. Um, uh, we have uh, we have a lot of interviews former students uh for example, uh, telling stories uh, from socialism system from 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, um, telling us stories how it was to be a student uh, during the the Yugoslavia. And but again, we had we, we had uh, um, students saying that they were all part of the uh, system, not thinking critically. That. Mm, that the, it, there were there were cultural uh, events more than, than than there is now definitely but again it was not all great and then you have students uh, from this uh, fr from this current period saying that uh, Podgorica is uncultural city that they are completely neglect neglected that they don't want to participate that they have other preoccupations and that's all valid and that's what makes this uh, archive rich and I um, hopefully uh, that will help uh, uh, students especially shape their future and current narratives uh, and uh, help them in their thinking process about what they want and where wh where they stand in these uh, systems and uh, again on the other hand I hope that we will see some future research artistic research and uh, um, from other fields research researching this community which was neglected not only in Montenegro but all around we, we don't hear a lot of uh, um, about the student experience and what it what it actually means Great. And I, I will uh, slowly move now to to the last question for this uh, uh, for this episode because we, we've touched on a lot of different uh, uh, different things. And what I would like to ask you for the end is the type of work that both of you uh, are doing. I think it contributes a lot to a different kind of uh, uh, collection of memory as well. So, what kind of room and how much space do you think there is within our societies? for your type of documentation, that for the type of archive building that you're doing to be more mainstreamed, if I may use that word, to, to play a role in how, we, uh, in how we remember. Because I also kind of at the beginning set it up as, well, yes, there, there are these so-called, I'm saying in quotes, like official histories and official truths. A lot of them also have to be challenged or some even rebuked. And there's a lot of projects and initiatives like yours, and the two of you are contributing in this area with your work. There's also other ones as well, but how much space is there for larger dissemination of the uh, type of documentation and archiving that uh, you are building? Uh, and me, maybe we can start with you and then uh, jump to Milena. I don't know. Uh, we're thinking, I mean, dissemination, you usually think in terms of audience, I guess. And... Uh, we have different audiences. I mean, we, we have that um, community of scholars that are interested in, in the Balkans. Uh, and then we have diaspora and then we have local, we have students and, and different groups, I guess, that are also interested in that, in those periods that we are covering or dealing with. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure about is it really important to think about its dissemination because it, it does have a, it's the type of material that kind of uh, finds itself to the right uh, receiver, I, I'm, I'm assuming. And then when it comes to intervening in larger narratives, uh, 
I mean, even if if I'm I'm just thinking out loud, if if we were to be disregarded <laughs> entirely, all our work, I think that would that would at least what we would do with it, uh, with what what uh, how our archive would contribute in it is that there is this scholar that is writing this dominant narrative, that this official narrative, but never consulted our sources. That speaks very poorly of every researcher. And our archive is accessible. It's open. It's it's online. It's open access. So there's no uh, no restrictions or no pr- procedures how to access what we have been produ- uh, been producing in the in the past decade. So we will. I think what we do ultimately is that we make it difficult for for anybody who who is endowed with such a role. <laughs> to write a more um, standardized history that suits everybody, to make it more complicated, to simplify history, because the resources are out there in the open and you just don't want to look at it. So that 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 speaks poorly of any any historian, really. Milena, how do you, uh, how do you see it? What has been your experience in this regard? Well, I must say, I mean, I do believe the, 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 in the power of the community archives, especially if we know that uh, uh, women, w- women history, for example, uh, shifted and uh, expanded uh, thanks to these kind of ar- archives. So there are many examples of, uh, of other uh, marginalized uh, group that, uh, whose history is now heard and, uh, and as I said, reshaped and uh, uh, t- thanks to these kind of initiatives. Um, as I said, we the student this student archive ar- archive of student experiences is the first of its kind in Montenegro, and this is uh, we are really just uh, st- starting with something. And if we leave it uh, as an open source and uh, uh, transfer this uh, um, work to to some younger uh, people in the future, we, it will be enough to transfer the energy into it, the, the idea itself that these kind of uh, stories needs to be uh, preserved and uh, and told. but I also want to mention that uh, Institute for Contemporary Art, this is not our first archive. We were working, uh, we started with the work on the anti-fascist movement of women in um, um, as a Yugoslavian heritage. And uh, uh, this was our first archive and it's still, we are still working on it. And uh, the second one that we are working on it is archive of Cetinje's uh, Biennale. Uh, um, I don't know, do you remember, or do you know, but there was a Biennale of Contemporary Art in, in Cetinje during the 90s. So during that political and social uphill and in uh, in it's for me. I'm I'm born in '92, and uh, when I uh, I joined uh, uh, five years ago to uh, to institute, and uh, I didn't know about Biennale, so I didn't learn about it uh, in school, in primary or higher education or. Uh, um, Nowhere, I, 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 non-formal education. There was no information about this, but and this is very important. Not only for this is a very important event. Not only for a uh, for contemporary art. Uh, it 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 had a big uh, uh, e- emancipation impact on the local community. There was it was happening for ten years. There were uh, people all around the world coming there, and uh, they they were discussing these big philosophical, like, political ideas. Ideas and uh, the, the life was happening there, and we we are not learning about it. So uh, these initiatives really have the power. It doesn't matter how much people you reach. I, I would agree with that. It doesn't have to be mainstream at the end. It will be maybe one day, but for now, it's uh, it's fine to go with small steps and uh, um, and and hope. Hope for the best and then do the work. Have the enthusiasm and and uh, keep that idea alive. Thank you. And it's unfortunate we don't have any more time because you brought up the role of also educational institutions that I think are so important to be discussed within the context of this topic. And hopefully we'll be able to have some other op- opportunity to, to come to it. But in the meantime, uh, Ermir and Milena, thank you so much for being on the show, for sharing all of your experience with your specific projects, but also this other very, very insightful uh, uh, reflection uh, on the topic in, in general. It was great having you on the show. 
Likewise. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure. Other Talking Points is the K2.0 podcast. You can listen to it regularly on our website, kosovo2.0.com, or by subscribing to Kosovo 2.0 on Spotify.